Hello everyone, I am Jelena Bighorn and this is my final assignment presentation. Uh, in regards to the braiding towards braiding book, there were three things that stood out to me uh, as an Indigenous person supporting other Indigenous people in a, a settler Indigenous context. Uh, the first was to just even be allowed to consider that there are brick and thread sensibilities. Even that is huge. Uh, so often, as even we saw in the text, those who think in a different way, the thread sensibilities are forced to think like bricks, and we're not even given the possibility or the space to consider that our ways are valid. So uh, articulating the difference between bread, uh, sorry, thread and brick, maybe they could become bread. Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, just giving, giving Indigenous people that space, I think is important. Uh, and then moving on to step one, facing the historical and systemic harm. One of the quotes really stood out to me that Indigenous staff, uh, artists and communities will be grateful for the opportunity to perform selected non-threatening aspects of their culture when the organization deems appropriate, that Indigenous staff, artists and communities should have a commitment to harmonious relationships. I always feel like it's my fault if the relationship isn't harmonious and that is incredibly damaging and it's manipulative that Indigenous people are supposed to constantly be the ones coming with humility and kindness and patience. Um, why can't we be angry? Why is it my fault that the white person sitting across from me can't get it? It's not my, it's been made to feel like it's my fault. So I think that step one uh, is really important. And in fact, my second, my last insight was also from step one. I don't know that we can get much farther actually. Um, and this quote was around uh, the act of inclusion in itself becomes a mean for the brick sensibility to reclaim universality. Whereas it once excluded difference, now it embraces it and therefore becomes all the more totalizing. Uh, it just, it reminds me of Helvetica and how it's become this like, uh, this font that means nothing, but it means everything. The brick mentality is able to take in other challenges to it and then just absorb it and make it like part of the brick system. So it looks like it's doing something positive, but it actually really isn't. The first article that I chose was Reconciling Indigenous Knowledge and Education, Promises, Possibilities and Imperatives by Marie Batiste. I chose this article because I'd heard the scholar's name many times and I was curious about their work. Uh, the article is basically the about the unfulfilled promises that politicians and governments have made regarding reconciliation uh, and the indigenous knowledges that go along with it uh, the and the possibilities that indigenous knowledge have that are made, that are protected by Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982 which calls on all levels of government to uphold inherent and existing treaty rights of indigenous peoples which of course then would apply to educational systems and policies. The article doesn't go into an explanation of what indigenous knowledges are, uh, except to say that they are diverse and fluid, but rather provides a legal groundwork to argue that they have the right to be protected. Various ways of indigenous scholars have paved the way to critique educational ed institutions and policies. Now we need to go one step further, um, using the backing of these key institutional or constitutional documents, uh, including UNDRIP and obviously the section 35. Uh, the text, this article affirmed my belief that there is significant lip service being done on multiple levels uh, regarding the, the inclusion of indigenous knowledges in educational settings. And obviously that more work needs to be done. It also made me feel incredibly grateful because in the 14 year gap between my two stints at UBC, uh, it's been a qualitative, like striking difference. And I think that is re in due to these scholars who have made such an impact in the academy. So really feeling that gratitude. This article connects to other articles that we've read by Akenahu, Daigle and Tuck. Uh, they all expressed how much we have to fight in order to get ourselves just in the door. And then when we do, of course, the rules are going to be changed. Uh, Batiste gives us a tool, again, this understanding of section 35 to use as additional ammunition. Uh, but honestly, it's frustrating because even with that added knowledge, uh, the oppressors will simply ignore the brilliance and we'll be still in the same positions that we are now. 
The second article that I chose was Indigenization as Inclusion, Reconciliation, and Decolonization, Navigating the Different Visions for Indigenizing the Canadian Academy by Gaudry and Lawrence. I chose this article because I feel I need more help articulating the different versions of reconciliation um, that I have between myself and my colleagues at work. Uh, this article looks at the range of indigenization methods. So there's three that they outline. Uh, they also include two avenues for change using treaty-based decolonial indigenization and in resurgence-based decolonization indigenization. <laughs> Uh, this article is helpful in that, well, at least it helps me understand uh, the resistance that Indigenous curricula will face as it is supposedly implemented. Basically, whatever the bare minimum is, that's what's going to be done. Um, so this it means including Indigenous persons in institutions, meaning uh, putting up buildings that people can gather. Basically, that's what will happen um, unless it's orange shirts. In that case, there's no budget and you can have as many as you want. It helped me think differently about reconciliation in that now I have a more specific approach, which is decolonial indigenization. Uh, I've seen many examples of inclusion, which is the weaker version. And I, to some degree, I'm a living example of what inclusion is. And I can tell you it doesn't feel good. It's a hollow existence that separates me from everyone else. So understanding that structural and procedural changes are required is very clear. It is also very clear that they will be wildly and widely uh, defended by those who are in power. This connects to all the other conversations that we've been having in the course um, in that Indigenous people are facing a huge obstacle when they're coming up against the non-Indigenous politic. It, this article pulls no, pulls no punches. It reminds us that the cultural, political, and econ economic institutions that have enjoyed hegemony will do anything that they can to keep that power and to be aware of that, to be constantly looking for different ways to create change that are act that is actually significant and meaningful.